Welcome everyone to today's webinar on the Women-Owned Business Outlook. Today is International Women's Day, and what better day to hear the results of original research by biz2credit.com. The Biz2Credit Women in Business Study provides rich data collected by Biz2Credit. This is actual data, and it's going to give us a look into the financial environment for women-owned businesses. So we're going to get up-to-date information on exactly what's happening with women-owned businesses so that you as a business owner, entrepreneur, or other interested party can draw insights from that and determine what you can and should do uh, better in order to gain credit in the future. Before we begin, I do want to go over just two housekeeping details. First, we will provide time for questions and answers at the end, so we ask that you hold your questions. We'll give at least 15 minutes at the end, and our panelists will answer your questions. Secondly, as far as how you ask your questions, if you look over to the right, you will see a little panel with a uh, little chat window, and you can type in your questions into the, type, the chat window as we go along. We'll collect those questions, and at the end, the panelists will attempt to answer them. And if you don't see your chat window there, just look for a little orange arrow and click the little left-facing arrow out, and it should open up your chat panel. So with that, let's get started. First, I'd like to show you today's presenters. Uh, I am Anita Campbell, and I am the moderator. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a women-owned business founder, and I am the founder of Small Business Trends. Next, we'll hear from Rohit Harora. He is one of the nation's leading fintech experts, and he's also the CEO and co-founder of Biz2Credit. And then we have two very talented uh, women business people here today. We have Moji Rotabidi. She is an investor in disruptive healthcare technology and founder and managing partner of BioVest LLC, and Dawn Fotopoulos. She's a serial entrepreneur, an award-winning author, and a former VP of Citibank. So let's do some more extended introductions. Uh, this is me, Anita Campbell. Our site, uh, Small Business Trends, has become one of the largest independently entrepreneur-owned sites out there just for small businesses. We provide information to help small business owners be successful every day, and our only focus is small business. We also uh, are, can find our content elsewhere all over the web. I publish myself on a variety of different places, including Open Forum and on the SBA community uh, site. Free to introduce Rohit Aurora, our CEO and founder of Biz2Credit. Rohit, uh, tell us a little about yourself. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Anita. So, so as Anita said, so, so my name is Rohit. I'm a co-founder of Biz2Credit. Uh, Biz2Credit is a online uh, credit uh, marketplace. We have uh, lent over 1.7 billion now uh, and we are very focused on helping small businesses get access to credit and also maintain their credit worthiness and we do it in a very uh, open transparent uh, fashion and also everything is done digitally, digitally. And the other thing I would like to add is that you know we actually do everything in-house including the underwriting, closing and post-closing so that we can take uh, best care of our uh, customers and also provide customers with virtual CFO platforms so that they can you know keep improving and benchmarking their businesses. Excellent, thank you. And I'd also like to introduce Dawn Fotopoulos. Dawn, tell us about you. Anita, it's great to be here. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was 22. I have launched, successfully launched or turned around eight businesses and product lines in six different industries. It's been a very busy life. <laughs> and I'm excited that Accounting for the Number Phobic, a survival guide for small business owners, which is published by Amicom Books, won the award from Small Business Trends a few years back, <clears throat> Best Business Book of 2015 in Economics. We're very proud of that. I'm currently an associate professor of business at the King's College. Uh, I ran businesses anywhere from 
fifty million to three hundred million in size when I was a VP at Citibank, and my passion really is to double small business survival rates because I think it's it's crazy that we have the kind of failure rates that we do, and the failure rates are particularly particularly high among women-owned businesses, and I'm in the process of fixing that, and I'd love to share some of the things that we've been doing in order to get there. Okay, we'll look forward to that, and I remember very well when you won the award from our, our Small Business Book Awards. The community <laughs> uh -huh. loved your book. All right, that's great. Okay, and then I would like to introduce Moji Rotabiti. Moji, tell us a little about you. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, actually. Anita, thank you for introducing me. Um, I'm currently the founder and uh, managing partner of a company uh, that's called BioVest. We actually invest in um, disruptive healthcare technologies, meaning uh, the biotech industry. We look at um, medical devices and new drug programs. Uh, my journey is, is somewhat interesting um, as an entrepreneur. Uh, my background is really in emerging markets finance, however, uh, living and working uh, in international markets and markets over the years where entrepreneurship is really part of uh, the culture of the environment that I was working in, which was uh, South Africa, my, my career has actually really evolved into, uh, in, into a female entrepreneur in this market. So today I'll just be sharing some of what I think uh, is, is important to be a successful entrepreneur. Awesome. Thank you for that, and we will look forward to that very much. So quickly, the agenda, we'll be uh, talking about the growth of women-owned businesses uh, for the year 2016. That's when the, the data was uh, gathered. We'll be talking about this gender gap in small business financing, and I know Rohit has some excellent uh, insights. It's not necessarily the best news, but it should give us some guidance as women business owners of what we can do and in that way I think it's going to be positive. We're going to talk about some small business initiatives for women business owners, uh, developments in the banking world and other topics related to entrepreneurship and small biz growth. Um, with that, Rohit, I'd like to turn to you. What are the realities for women business owners? Yeah, so I think that's a very good question and we have been doing this uh, now study for last four years and obviously you know there are some trends which are very clear one is you know more women are are graduating from college compared to men I think there's a more of a job crisis uh, with men today than women uh, and and the other thing is that you know uh, there is a bigger push coming in from women owned businesses now you know more women are go are getting into their own businesses uh, so I think that all is very good news uh, and what we have seen is that you know over the last four or five years access to capital has improved. There's still a gap between access to capital for men and women owned businesses, but that gap has actually uh, you know I would say there has been a stronger growth of women owned businesses. So the gap has not narrowed as much as I was expecting, but still it's it's not widening. So I think that's that's a good news. And I foresee as more women get into businesses and as their businesses get bigger, that gap should also go down, you know, over time, actually. Yeah, so we can go to the next slide, uh, you know, Anita. Yeah. Okay, um, well with that, let me give you a few statistics about women-owned uh, businesses. Uh, there are 9.1 million women-owned enterprises and employing 7.9 million workers. And think about that, 1.4 trillion in revenues. So that's not billion, it's not million of course, it's trillion with a T. And that's a pretty impressive uh, number there. So if you imagine if all the women-owned businesses went away tomorrow, that would be a huge hit to the American economy. The number of women-owned firms grew at, at one and a half times the national rate between 1997 and 2014, so that was a very fast growth rate. Uh, and, and also the revenue and employment growth among companies owned by women topped that of all other firms except for the big publicly traded firms. So when you think about this kind of growth and how women are coming into their own, that's a very positive story and, and I'm really glad to be part of that. Uh, I think you know, any women business owner should, should feel proud of 
you know, being part of starting something and growing a business, or if you're in a family business, uh, be, being a part with your family of what's there. So it's really remarkable when you consider also the growth in the number of firms owned by women of color. Now that's also very interesting. And think about this too, you know, women of color have two things that they have to deal with. They have to deal with being women and perhaps their family uh, obligations that they have to juggle and then also being uh, uh, of color. So, you know, I think again that is quite remarkable. So comprising just 17% of women-owned firms 17 years ago, now women-owned firms account for about one-third uh, when you look at the women of color. So that's pretty amazing how women of color have come along. All right. The biz to credit data shows that the states with the highest number of women applying for business funding are, interestingly, some of the bigger states, but also states along the coast. Uh, I'm not surprised by California and Texas and New York uh, being the top three in a way because they are very big, but interestingly, Georgia and North Carolina seem to be hotbeds, so we'll hear more from Rohit, I'm sure, as to why that is. So this is the fourth year that biz to credit has done this study, and it's based on 25,000 loan applications, and I want to emphasize again, you know, this is not just asking people what they think, this is real data collected from real businesses. And of those loan applications, almost 30% were women-owned company, and this is data on 7,500 female entrepreneurs who requested funding at Biz2 Credit. Rohit, let's delve in a little bit further. Tell us more about this women in business study. What, what's the good, the bad, the ugly? Give it all to us. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so as I said, this is our fourth year. So I think the good news is we are seeing uh, three very clear trends. One is uh, number of uh, you know, women-owned businesses which are applying for credit, outside credit, has jumped up dramatically. When we started the study the first year, it was only 7 or 8% that has gone up to 29%, which is a huge jump. I think the other good news is as the economy has improved, you know, women-owned businesses have shown a solid growth. Uh, so in terms of their revenue growth, it has been 47% year over year. It's still less than men-owned businesses, but, you know, this is the uh, fastest growth that we have seen over the last, you know, three years. Uh, the other thing that we've also seen is that, you know, uh, as uh, Anita said, you know, a while uh, California, Texas and New York are usual suspects, you know, because these are the places where the population of small businesses is, high, is highest. What what we are seeing is a lot of, you know, women-owned businesses coming in from Georgia and North Carolina. And there's a reason behind it because as, as the earlier slide said that, you know, more women are graduating than men and this has been a trend for last now 15 years. More women are getting into starting their businesses which are actually knowledge-based businesses. And what we are seeing as a trend, you know, a recent report from uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics also showed that actually the technology and the knowledge-driven small businesses are even capturing market share from large firms in U.S. And that's even more true of women because, you know, women are more well qualified now. Women tra traditionally has, had, had less capital. They were not getting into a lot of manufacturing kind of businesses, but a lot of services business are up their alley. It's like, you know, dealing with customers, dealing with uh, knowledge, you know, kind of a business. So I think we are seeing a, a very good trend, you know, very strong trend. I think the challenge still is that, you know, the, compared to revenue of the men-owned businesses and there are other attributes that we will, you know, talk about on other slides. But, you know, the lot of credit indicators, women-owned businesses are still uh, pretty weak compared to men-owned businesses, and that then reflects in their approval rates, in their revenue, in their uh, credit scores, and also, you know, that also then forces more women-owned businesses to look for alternative lending compared to bank lending, which obviously is more expensive, you know, for them to get. So I think uh, that's the good and the bad news uh, for 2016, you know, actually. Uh, so, if you see on this slide, I, as I was saying, you know, re revenue is one of the most important aspects in any small business. So, you know, especially not only for access to credit, but also for the health of a business. So, I think uh, 
uh, last year was very good for women owned businesses uh, you know uh, it was the fastest growth in last you know 3 4 years 47% so 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 that was very impressive you know growth uh, for wo for women owned businesses and also we, are, we also have to keep in mind that this was on an increasing uh, you know baseline uh, so it's not just you know like uh, so more uh, more women owned businesses are getting started more women owned businesses are surviving you know what they call is the first thousand days which is the most critical period for a small business and yeah. and more of these you know women owned small businesses are starting to look for outside credit which is a sign of their confidence in their growth prospects so that's where we saw a very solid growth of 47% which is great and uh, and as you know you can see the you know uh, mm, that is something you know uh, pretty interesting because their annual earnings were you know last year was uh, or, or a year prior to that was you know less uh, compared to what happened you know this year so i think uh, but the bad news still is as i said the earlier was that you know women owned businesses are still significantly smaller than men owned businesses and that actually impacts them you know uh, in terms of contracting opportunities in terms of uh, credit opportunities in terms of growth opportunities and i think that's a gap that you know i I personally uh, have been expecting that gap to narrow, but that hasn't really narrowed much. And there are a few reasons behind it. One is obviously, you know, men have more experience in uh, setting up businesses and also scaling up the businesses. I think uh, it's just that, you know, uh, more of them have done it in the past because setting up a business is one thing, but, you know, scaling up the business is, uh, is, is a different, you know, animal. And I think that's where you know, I think as more women-owned businesses grow and survive and go to the next level, they will be able to, to you know, a, a subset of them will be able to scale up also, you know, as, as we speak. So I think the next slide really talks about, you know, some of these issues that, you know, so, so what also happens is that, you know, as the women-owned businesses are smaller than men-owned businesses, so the amount of money that they qualify for also, also goes down, you know, so that's also something that, you know, is actually... Uh, good and bad. It's good in a sense that you know, women-owned businesses are in services sectors, so uh, a lot of times they also need less working capital. But it's bad in a sense that when the economy is growing, you know, that's actually a good time to have more access to capital to grow your business faster, and that's where you know they get a little you know uh, like held back because of that. And also, you know, if you're looking for less money to today, unfortunately in U.S., you know, most of the banks are not very keen to do very small loans you know they are more keen to do larger loans so so that you know takes you away from that you know pool of bank loan money that uh, traditional small businesses can have access to and i think next slide really you know uh, you know talks about that you know that what is happening with women entrepreneurs and moji can you know really talk about it also you know thank you uh, with that, uh, moji uh Take it away. Yeah, that was very interesting insights. And so, so tell us about this environment out there. What, what do you see, Moji? Well, it's been my experience that um, within the environment right now for women entrepreneurs is very right. It was very ripe. However, you know what Rohit has just uh, talked about is a very real um, situation. But you know, I, I've seen that there's been a large push right now for diversity and, and inclusion, um, particularly with supplier diversity procurement. Um, there's an initiative that exists that um, companies need to utilize established best practices in order to achieve higher percentages of both what they call uh, an inverted commas tier one, which is direct contractor, and tier two, which is the subcontractor procurement. Uh, with vendors that are owned by women and and uh, women and minorities, um, and worldwide, I think more women. I mean, today is International Women's Day. Uh, more women are actively pursuing uh, entrepreneurship. And if I could just talk a minute about what's happening internationally, uh, more females. Um, internationally start up businesses in Africa as a percentage of the entire population which is about 1.2 billion on the continent uh, people in females in South Africa um, particularly entrepreneurship is a scene that's thriving especially for them uh, companies led by women in China is also 
8% more profitable than their male counterparts in the same country. And some women are running incredible, really incredible businesses out there. Um, and female-led firms, if we bring it back to the United States, on the S&P index had an average of 50% growth over the market average of 25%. So women-run businesses are really actually outperforming male-led businesses, um, despite some of these, these, these very real challenges. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, to bring back the importance of education, which uh, Rohit also had, had mentioned previously that more women are getting uh, degrees now. Um, if I can talk about my own uh, experience uh, being in the emerging markets for many years um, and in finance, and I returned to back to the United States from South Africa with a uh, small child, and I decided that I wanted to do an MD-PhD program which really wasn't uh, so conducive for my family at the time. Uh, however, using the studies, the additional studies that I was doing, I decided to turn that into an entrepreneurial opportunity for me, and that's how I began to use what I had learned in my additional studies when I returned to the country in science to be able to turn it into a, a business idea. So I fully support that women should participate in anything that if you have a business idea you need to to understand what it is that you're doing so participate in the short courses um, engage in webinars such as this and network as much as you possibly can with people because just having a vision of what you want to do is just really uh, not enough uh, if you take them to the next slide um, and in order to uh, be an entrepreneur, you also have to have an innate appetite for risk. Um, you need to identify some of what your strongest uh, skill sets are and apply what you've learned in previous employment um, in school. And man so because managing and growing your business is just as important as, as starting it. And if you don't have the skills that you feel is totally necessary to take your business to the next step. My advice would also to be uh, launching an advisory board. I didn't know everything I needed to know about uh, the biotech industry, particularly with, um, with uh, certain products, oncology products, for example. So I developed for myself what's called an advisory board. So I pulled in the knowledge and the expertise that I needed to be able to further upskill myself and to be able to take my business to the to the next level. And um, in terms of relationships, network, 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 continuously network. Um, there's so much value in uh, speaking to other people in order to really position yourself, uh, you know, going forward. Excellent. Um, great. Those are uh, great pieces of advice and insights, Moji. So thank you very much for that. And I'm sure we'll have questions for you. Uh, at the end there, I can already uh, see a couple of them coming in. With that, I would like to turn to Don Fotopoulos. So we've got a really interesting hashtag up there at the, be <laughs> at the top of this slide. So Don, tell us about all this. <laughs> Get the most from your county pro. Well, most just very important points. She said, for example, that managing your business is just as important as starting it and growing it. So if small business survival for women-owned businesses is what we're really after, not just surviving, but thriving in any economic environment, then just growing your top line is not going to be enough. And what I have seen, Anita and friends, is, and I've heard this for the last 17 years, and riffs on this, I'm killing myself, I'm not making any money, um, I want to grow my business, and what I have seen is if somebody is running a business, female or male, um, I did a talk at the National Association of Women Business Owners years ago, and this is what crystallized it for me. It was called I Hate Numbers, Accounting for the Number Phobic. And it was like the receiving line at a wedding after I spoke, and I heard these kinds of quotes, and one woman actually said to me, I didn't know I was going bankrupt till I came here. So 
if we're listening to what Moji said and said, you know, you got to be equipped, which is what the short courses and the webinars were all about, she's absolutely right because what that does is that reduces your risk profile. If you really understand what next steps are and how to, for example, to read your financial statements, you won't get into the conundrum that goes like this. I can't pay my bills. So the way I'm going to dig myself out of that hole is I'm going to go find more customers. Oh, but I'm not finding them fast enough. I'm not growing my top line revenues fast enough. So I'm going to discount my prices to close more business. But by doing that, I'm going to destroy my profitability and I'm going to buy myself another three or four million and hours worth of work every day and all I have succeeded in doing is scaling losses so what we want to do for women business owners particularly because we get stuck in this is we want to reverse that so let's see how to do that next slide okay so here is a three-step plan on how to reverse the doom loop is what Jim Collins affectionately refers to it the first thing is you got to change your mindset you really do because accounting is not a done for me service just because you're a really great service provider doesn't mean you know how to run a business running a business is a completely different skill set and it's it and there's no place to go to learn how to do that at least not until a couple of people wrote some very useful books I would submit that accounting for the number phobic is 101 before you put one dollar at risk you've got to engage in your numbers and in a minute I'll tell you how to do that um, so you got to change your mindset first of all accounting is not a done for me service your accountant isn't just a subcontractor that throws a bunch of of, uh, of reports to the IRS every year those reports are for you let's go back those three the top three there we go know your numbers and then ask your accounting pro okay let's go through it change your mindset all right 80 according to the intuit company 87 percent of small business owners and that probably includes female business owners uh, are doing their own bookkeeping and it's a really bad idea it's a bad idea because if the numbers are not clean if you don't set up your chart of accounts correctly it becomes impossible to unwind it so setting up the books hiring somebody who's a professional to do that is a fabulous investment please do this the other thing is when you're going to apply for a loan your numbers have to be clean there too when Rowett and his and his team do the underwriting they got to be able to look at those numbers and have confidence in them so DIY bookkeeping is a bad idea if you want to know where to find good bookkeepers, go to findaproadvisor.com. Look for somebody who has, it's like an Angie's List for bookkeepers. They're experts in the Intuit um, accounting platform, which is the industry standard. Go there and you can see all kinds of comments for somebody in your area. At any rate, accounting isn't a done for me service. You're not going to, your accountant's not going to run your business any more than your mechanic is going to drive your car. Okay, you're going to manage the business. When the bank has a question, they call you, which means you, there's some basic information you need to feel comfortable with. And your accounting professional is really not just a number cruncher. They're so smart. They're sitting on all your data. They know exactly what's going on. So they can be your business therapist. They can help you solve problems. Use them this way. And so I've heard some, con some comments like, my client pays for my hands and they could have my brain cells too but they never listen. A riff on this is accountants have been telling me, you know, I've been giving them good advice. They haven't listened when they don't like the advice, they fire the accountant. Please don't do that. If your accountant's giving you good advice, listen to them. So don't drive with your eyes closed. Drive with your eyes open. Know your numbers. And what are the numbers? The, the bottom line is you got to be able to answer three questions. Anybody who is in business, no matter how large or small, no matter for how long, you got to be able to answer three key diagnostic questions. Am I making money? Do I have enough cash to pay the bills? And am I building wealth or destroying it? So here's the data point from, JP Mor from the J.P. Morgan Institute that just came out last year. And it said the following, 75% of small businesses in the U.S have 30 days or less in cash on hand. 25% of the 27 odd million businesses have two weeks or less, roughly they are less than one payroll away from bankruptcy. And this is not a problem, it's an epidemic. 
So you got to ask the why question. Well, if you believe the Intuit company that says 47% of small business owners that they surveyed claimed financial illiteracy, then if we fix the financial illiteracy part of the equation, then in theory, we can fix a lot of those other issues. Am I making any money? Well, you got to learn how to look at your net income statement. And basically what these three statements are, your income statement, your cash flows, your statement of cash flows, and your balance sheet are your financial dashboard. You have a dashboard in your car, you have it there for a reason, so as you're driving you can tell what's going on under the hood, it is the same thing in a business. And it's really not much more complicated than that, and number phobic is close to my heart. It is now in three languages, Anita, I didn't know if you knew that. It's English, Chinese, and it's coming out in Espanol next year. I'm excited, Mariette Martinez, who is a, an influencer in the space, she's a mompreneur, she is an accounting expert. She's a genius. Is a, she's a leader in the Latina uh, and Latino entrepreneur community. I love her. And uh, the point is we want to make this available to everybody. It's the only book on accounting that will make you laugh. It's illustrated by a Disney artist to try to break through all the intimidation. But, but here's the thing. You're not alone. But you need to understand, are you making money, do you have enough cash, and are you building wealth or destroying it? Because guess what? This is what your loan officer is going to be asking, and they're going to be looking at your numbers to see what the answers are. The monthly statement review is a huge missed opportunity right now. If you've got a bookkeeper, in all likelihood what they're doing is they're reconciling your books every month, your accountant should be doing this too, and sending them to you. And when I asked 3,000 pro advisors when I was a keynote at Scaling New Heights last year, if they send these statements every month, they all raised their hands and said, yes, they do. When I asked them how many of their customers opened up those statements and actually looked at them, the whole place went up into an uproar of laughter. Because what they're saying is nobody opens them, nobody understands what they're saying, and here's the deal. The numbers are your business. It is the mirror to your business. Think of your numbers like your spouse. They're always talking to you, but are you listening to them? So do you read them? Do you understand what they're saying? And do you do anything differently after you see what those numbers are reflecting to you? And What those numbers are are basically a reflection of did you make good business decisions in the last business period? Because now what we want to do is we want to make some course corrections so we don't make the same mistakes going forward. And frankly, we can rev the engine on those areas where we made really great decisions. So it's a huge opportunity, but what it also does, it makes you blind to risk when you don't read those statements and you don't understand what they mean. So the good news is, if you do get up to speed, number phobic is just one way to do it. It's an efficient way to do it by reading the book. Um, then looking at your statements every month is going to be like Christmas. You know, it's going to be like the holidays. You can't wait to see your results because now you finally understand what they mean. And this is the kind of aha. These are the aha moments that we've been getting when people have either read the book and applied the concepts or the accounting professional has actually bought the book and given it to the client and said, listen, don't talk to me until you read the first four chapters. So it's been very useful and it's created a bridge. That knowledge becomes so important because then the, then the conversations become so much richer between your accounting professional. So what if you could improve cash flow with your existing customers? That's how you win the game. Don't just scale for scale's sake. Remember, don't just scale losses. You want to scale profits and cash flow. And what if it's possible to do that without adding work and complexity? So remember something. If your cash flow is really tight, if, you, if your profits are trending lower, if your net worth is shrinking, in other words, your asset, uh, your liabilities are growing faster than your assets, these are not problems. They are symptoms of problems. And you've got to ask the why question. And I want you to remember that your accounting professional is your most important collaborator. So Moji earlier was talking about having an advisory board. Well, your accounting professional should really be on that advisory board. This is somebody who knows all the nuttiness that you're doing in your business. They know how you're commingling your personal and your business expenses. They know that you're paying too much money for X, Y, and Z. These are people that should have your back. You need to listen to them. And they really are your most important collaborator. Well, that was terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Dawn. And I'm sure we'll have some great questions for you. That was a lot to think about there.
All right. Uh, so at this point, I'm back over to Rohit. Rohit, uh, I wonder if you could give us more detail about the Women in Business study. Tell us more. Yeah. So I think as Don rightly said, cash flow. Uh, the analysis of cash flow, you know, cash flow is uh, is like lifeblood of any business, and and one of the things that you know, as we see, you know, women-owned businesses have traditionally been smaller than men-owned businesses, and we also see that the credit score is actually uh, weaker, uh, or or uh, you know, or less than compared to men-owned businesses. And credit score, you know, especially in small business lending, plays a big role until unless you have a more well-established business with like very strong cash flow. So I think uh, if you can see, if you see here, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the credit score of uh, the women-owned businesses uh, in in our study in last one year has actually dropped, uh, and that's a good news and a bad news. You know, uh, I think I think the area of concern is not that it has dropped. The area of concern is that there is a gap of 17 points between men-owned businesses and women-owned businesses credit score because anytime you are below 600, you are a subprime. And anytime you are above 600, you're not really prime, but you start getting into, you know, uh, more towards, uh, you know, like a near prime kind of a customer. So I think, uh, having said that, 595, you know, is not a great credit score, but you know that also shows that since uh, you know more uh, women-owned businesses have more confidence in looking out for credit, so they're applying for credit. Because one mistake which a lot of which a lot of women-owned businesses do is that they don't. Uh, try to access outside credit sooner and that to Don's point is very important because once you start doing that you will start you know booking up interest expenses you will start being forced to maintain your books because then every year you will have to you know give updated numbers to your lenders so so then you have more accountability in your business which is very important because most of the small business owners you know whether they are men or women don't like to look at financials they don't like to look at numbers they are scared about it they don't have time they don't have the discipline to do that and that when you combine with weaker credit scores actually leads to you know uh, less access to bank capital and more uh, and 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 the access to capital becomes more expensive which in the short term is okay if you're if you know what you are using the money for uh, but obviously in the long term that can be harmful you know kind of stuff so I think that's where women businesses need to plan better and do a better job, uh, you know, there that how they also can maintain their personal credit scores as they try to grow their business. And I think the next slide really, you know, uh, you know, captures. Well, I yeah, know. so I, I I can't read gibberish, so you'll have yeah. to you'll have to tell us it didn't convert properly with the, yeah. the uh, fonts. But uh, what what yeah. would you like to see change? Yeah, I think so. I I think there are uh, a few things that uh, you know we would like to. You know, see change. Obviously, you know, as, as I said earlier, that you know, uh, you know. So the good news again is more women are starting business. More women are starting to look for uh, you know more formal credit stuff, which is all good because you know that clearly means that you know they are getting more confident. I think, uh, as we said, you know, what this slide really sh shows is that male-owned businesses still earn. 60% more in revenues compared to you know female owned businesses or women owned businesses average credit score is 17 points up so like uh, there's a 17 point difference between men and women which i think is is something uh, you know I, I would ideally like to see it being at par i would like to see you know women owned businesses are growing faster but that should also result in uh, you know less revenue gaps because 60% is a huge gap in revenue because once you look at revenue gap and the credit score gap you know that really forces more women owned businesses either not getting access to formal credit or or having to bootstrap longer and longer which will even offset which will which will make uh, like the growth of women owned businesses less than men owned businesses down the line mm -hmm. i think the one good news out here is you know uh, is that you know the average uh, uh, Age of women-owned businesses, it's both good and bad, is is 35 months compared to 44 months for male-owned businesses. Now, part of it, we can explain the reason is also because of the fact that, you know, we, uh, you know, like the whole phenomenon of women setting up businesses is more recent than men. Uh, and the other piece is that, you know, as more women get more experience, you know, then they, the survivorship will also increase. Uh, but the challenge in that is that, you know, more women-owned businesses will survive or thrive better 
but once they also have more access to, to formal credit, which I think is still a bigger challenge for women-owned businesses. And I think that is something that, you know, is, is like the next slide really, you, you know, uh, you know, have some of the tips of how to do it. So obviously, you know, during the first two years of your business, your personal credit is very important because that's where a lot of the credit decisions will come from. So you have to keep your debts and control your personal debts. You have to ensure that, you know, you are paying your vendors on time. You have to ensure that you don't have a lot of revolving debt. So anytime if your credit card debt is more than 50% uh, and it stays there, it will pull down your credit score. You know, you need to establish your business credit history pretty quick, you know, by, you know, putting it on uh, uh, DNB, by like uh, applying and getting a company credit card and by, you know, segregating your company expenses separately from your personal expenses. You know, in certain cases, if you're able to pay your bills, you know, in advance, you can get discounts, you know, uh, which is actually very good because that also show you more prompt pair. And as, you know, Don rightly said, you know, when you get your monthly statements from your bookkeepers, you know, you don't even open and look at it. So one of the things that we have done is that, you know, we have developed a digital tool known as Biz Analyzer, where, you know, we, we will look at your bank data uh, monthly and can give you all the highlights, including how many bounce checks you have, how much overdraft fee you are paying, you know, uh, whether you are getting your money on time, because you have to follow up for your account receivables, you know. Uh, nobody likes to pay you on time if you don't follow up. And I think the other thing is you have to operate a leaner business, you know, like, uh, like you know, don't add cost too quickly. You know, if you are sitting in an office, try to make it as overcrowded as possible before you move to a new space, you know. Uh, so be very, very wise about how to spend money. And I'm not saying that, you know, don't spend money to grow the business, but a lot of time, you know, business owners will just spend money feeling that, that, you know, if they spend a lot of money, they can grow the business fast, and that's not true. So I think that's something important, and that's why we get this whole virtual CFO platform totally free. So whether you apply for a loan, you don't apply for a loan, you get a loan, you don't get a loan, you can sync up your bank accounts, you can sync up your payment accounts, you can, uh, you know, sync up your personal credit, we'll do a soft pull only, so, so no impact on your credit, and that way it will help you to, you know, keep analyzing your uh, cash flow, because as Don said, you know, that's something like, like, you know, you have to do it, you know, one way or the other, because if you, if you are not well informed about your own business, you will never be able to grow your business. And I think the challenges that small businesses face every day, and we have seen it as, you know, they're busy, you know, they, they have too much of work, it's, it's a high pressure environment, they're looking for money, they don't know what is the best product, they don't know what is the best rate, they have no idea, you know, where to go. A lot of banks still are totally manual in nature. They don't have anything online or, or anything digital. So I think, uh, and for a lot of banks and uh, the lenders also, that's the same. So, so that's why we are seeing all these marketplaces like uh, ours, you know, have become a big channel and a source and, and a resource tool. So use, uh, you know, folks like us, we are free of cost. We are not charging you anything. You know, we make our money uh, by lending you money or arranging money, not by charging you any fee. And I think that's something important that you need to realize that, you know, you, you have to use it for credit as well as for other tools out there. And and as we said, it's, it's all free. You know, we, we can give you a free consultation. You know, funding comes fast. Approvals are quick. It's very transparent. And there is no need to fill out any paper application or do any paperwork offline you know everything can be done online because I think we have reached a stage in our evolution that it's all digital and I think the last thing I want to say is that you know the products that we offer they 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 include bank loans they they include alternative lending they include SBA loans they include uh, commercial real estate financing so we have a varied product range that you can get from us and get it in a very streamlined and a time-bound fashion without having to go through reams and reams of paperwork and also ongoing basis you can manage, map, benchmark your cash flow and your business. You know. okay. Excellent. That was very good, um, Rohit, and, and sounds like there's a lot that people can get by visiting the uh, biz2credit.com website for for more, whether it's the business analyzer or, uh, you know, to, uh, to actually uh, start a loan application there. So with that, we have come up to our question and answer period. So we've got uh, got a number of questions here, and and um, 
there's one question I would like to kick off with, and that is for Rohit. And Rohit, it relates to the revenue growth among women-owned businesses. Now, there was a pretty healthy revenue growth that we saw in your study from year over year, and I think it was something like 47%. <clears throat> Um, given that kind of hefty revenue growth, to what do you attribute that? Was that to the fact that, um, you know, w was it just coincidental that, that more, you know, bigger businesses are, are applying for credit, or do you see that as just a continuation of the growth among women-owned businesses, or, or what was the reason for that? Um, yeah, I would say that's a very good question, and, and it's a combination of, you know, b bigger businesses you know because typically if business is doing okay you know you don't look for outside credit until unless you are confident about your growth prospects so i think that happened in 2016 i think 2016 was a strong follow up year from 14 and 15 and people uh, you know small business owners were feeling more confident i think the second thing is you know as as i said earlier you know uh, women owned businesses are you know in service sector and all that you know have seen above average growth in 2015 and 16 especially 16 you know compared to you know manufacturing businesses or other businesses where women are not that you know a bigger percentage uh, and the other thing i think what is also starting to happen is that as more women owned businesses start and as they flourish i think they have gone gain more experience in how to grow their business so i think they have reached a certain stage in their life cycle where you know they have uh, you know, certain amount of resources and and a lot of experience that they can start growing it faster. So, bigger businesses coming on online, trying to apply. You know, they're going away from offline and going on online to apply for loans. More confidence in the economy. You know, faster growth in the sectors where these businesses are, especially digital, e-publishing, e-knowledge businesses, which are growing very fast right now. And also, you know, uh, the businesses. You know, as 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 we see as they mature you know, they get better and they get stronger, you know, actually over time. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, I've got a question here from Moti. So, Moti, you mentioned advisory board and how that transformed your own business. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you went about setting up your advisory board and any uh, tip or two that you might have for people about what to do or not to do? Sure. Um, well, once you pinpoint what it is you want to do um, and you recognize your own limitations, then what I did is I went through uh, my list of contacts that I've had and gained over the years of working in finance abroad and, and, and domestically. And through that network, um, I would explain to each person, especially when I was, uh, it was very challenging for me to, uh, difficult to raise funding initially for me um, because of the nature of the business. Uh, you know, companies or lenders want to see or financiers want to see uh, initial proof of concepts. And conceptually, uh, biotechnology is, uh, it's not a, initially a tangible product unless people can see what the actual technology is. So I align myself with, with individuals who could help me in terms of explaining the science, um, the science behind what it was that I wanted to do. Um, and really just, you know, whether it's friends or family or former business associates or your alumni associations, that's really how I went about um, developing my advisory board because um, as an entrepreneur, your product, it's, it's, it's really uh, challenging to, uh, people have to trust in, in you and the people that you bring forward and they have to be credible um, individuals in order to really establish yourself as an, entrepre as a, as an entrepreneur in general. Um, in order to develop and grow your business. So that's how I did that. Uh, great, uh, great advice. Now, here's a question that came in through Twitter for Dawn Fotopoulos. The uh, question is, you said someone told you, I didn't know I was going bankrupt until I came. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, uh, Rowan said something. He said, cash is the lifeblood of your business, and it is. So here's a data point that nobody ever thinks about, Anita, that you could be showing a profit and still be going bankrupt. 
Your net income statement could look positive on the bottom line, and you could still be going bankrupt. And why is that? Because the definition of bankruptcy is running out of cash and sources of cash. So if your revenues, for example, don't all translate into cash flow, or if there's too big a time lag, it is very possible to look profitable and still be going bankrupt. So uh, that's why just looking at the net income statement for example, is just not enough. That's why the dashboard, the income statement, the cash flow statement, and the balance sheet together, all three of them give you a 360 degree view of the business. And any underwriter worth their salt is going to be looking at all three, and they're going to look particularly at growth trends. So Rohit had mentioned this earlier. They're going to look at what's trending in revenues. They're going to look at what's trending in cash flow. So not just where you are, where you've come from, and what's the likelihood that that number is going to get bigger and stronger in the not-too-distant future, because if they give you a loan today, that, of course, represents risks for the lender, and the lender wants to know, will they have the ability and will they have the motivation to pay that back with interest because that represents an opportunity cost for them. If they make a loan and that loan goes south, that's money that they could have lent to another business that would have been uh, more successful. So at any rate, uh, it's really important that you understand what your cash flow statement is saying and this is this is a more subtle thing but it's very important most small business owners that are just getting started account on a cash basis in other words they don't they don't acknowledge a, a revenue or an expense until it actually converts to cash the problem with that is a lot of times we have these accounts payables we've made relationships with our suppliers we built relationships with suppliers where we will owe them money but if you're accounting only on a cash basis it doesn't show up as a liability it looks like we're blind to that expense um, most people that are doing underwriting they want to see accounting on what's called an accrual basis and it will capture the cash transactions but it will also capture the people that owe you money in other words your accounts receivables clients that you've shipped clients that you've done business for but who haven't paid you yet and it will also capture your accounts payable liabilities that you have incurred because you're legally required to pay something to somebody at some point in the near future um, and so they can get the full financial picture so it's a little bit more expensive to ask your accountant to account on an accrual basis, but if you do that, you're going to be far more, far more likely to get the loan and get the size loan that you're really after. Mm -hmm. Good, good point. And and uh, you know, we had to make that transition in my business to an accrual basis. Uh, it really does give you a truer picture. I will tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, Rohit, I want to go back to something you mentioned. You talked about running a lean business. So I think we can all get a sense of what a lean business is. Tell us, based on what you see among those applying for credit, would you say that that is a problem? Would you say that not running a lean business is a problem among small businesses? I mean, do you see small businesses overspending? Or what do you see? I think in certain cases, uh, you know, that happens. So, you know, one of the things that you have to look at numbers like what, are your, what is your, you know, there are two kind of expenses. There are fixed expenses and there are variable expenses. So, so let's look at, you know, expenses which are variable like your payroll and other stuff. So you need to have a idea about, you know, what your payroll expenses are compared to your revenue and, and how you do benchmark against the industry. Uh, you know, I've seen instances, I've seen instances where, you know, somebody will open up a high-end fancy restaurant, you know, they're just a small businesses and they will just hire, you know, so many people initially just in that, you know, whole, you know, enthusiasm and, you know, wow, it's it's going to grow, expectation of growth. So I think a lot of times that expectation of growth, you should not be hiring based on that. You should be hiring based on the actual growth. You know, I've seen that in services businesses, I've seen that in retail businesses that you know a lot of people get so excited and they are saying wow well, you know or, or I got two orders and, and I can get more orders pretty quickly so you you have to be very careful about your hiring plans about you know how much space you take you know, let's say if you're taking a retail location you know you have to 
you know, uh, figure out, you know, how much lease you can pay. The, there will be good months, there will be slow months, busy months, slow months. So, like, you, you, you have to factor in everything. And I've seen this, this lean businesses, the concept of lean businesses could be, you know, better optimization of your workforce, better optimization of your expenses. Just negotiating your contracts, you know, is, I think, extremely important. A lot of small businesses don't do a good job with that. You know, uh, they don't collect their AR on time. You know, they will just let it stay there longer than what it should have happened. You know, uh, uh, they will not negotiate the right payment terms when they are paying out their bills. So this happens all the time because if you see a big company, they always, you know, try to collect the money as quickly as possible and pay you, uh, if you're a vendor to a large company, at least 90 to 120 days out there. And that's why they are big companies because, you know, they have figured out a way of how to have a negative cash flow uh, you know, a need, you know, that, okay, I can get money in collect quick and pay slow kind of stuff. So I'm not saying you have to delay your payments or anything, but you have to have those contractual negotiation skills for your variable and your fixed cost. And then you need to keep an eye on it. I think that's, that's important. That's where a lot of business owners just, you know, miss that big issue is that they don't keep an eye on their cost. They don't keep an eye on their ratio, financial ratios, you know, like, okay, how much money I'm spending, how much I can make, and how can I get better and more productive? You know, uh, they will take fancy offices. They will love to you know, show to the world that we have we have arrived and all that kind of stuff. You know, I think the best example in this country is Warren Buffet. You know, he he's, he still lives in the same house. You know, he still drives a Lincoln. You know, he still uh, you know takes a three dollar fifty two cents breakfast every day. So I think the whole idea is that you know you have to be smart about it and you have to set an example yourself. You know, if you really want to grow your business. Yeah. Very good. That's a um, very wise insight. Well, I think we have come to the end of our hour. This has been packed full. I'm sure we could have talked for another hour. This is uh, great information. Uh, and before we go, I want to give you a chance, uh, Rohit, to just tell us again where can people go in order to, uh, you know, find out more and take action. Yeah. So you know, as as people can see on the screen, they can go on our URL. They can you know, call our toll-free number, they can send us an e email at info at biztocredit.com and, you know, and they don't need to apply for a loan, they can get free consultation, they can, you know, uh, we have a knowledge center, they can download all these reports, they can, you know, we'll, we'll send a recording of this webinar to all the registered users, you know, we'll put it on our social media sites. So the whole idea is that, you know, we are trying to genuinely, you know, help small businesses with not just access to credit, but with a lot of resources, knowledge, uh, and other tools also. You know. All right. Well, thank you very much. I would like to thank all of our panelists here, Rohit Arora, the uh, the CEO and co-founder of Biz2Credit.com, Don Fotopoulos, and Moji Rovidi. Thank you, Rotidi. Excuse me. Thank you very much uh, to each of you. You've all been excellent. And with that, my name is Nita Campbell, and our webinar is now concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anita.